That's a, an excellent introduction. Actually, some of you may have had an EEG. Who's had an EEG before? Yes, sometimes the circumstances aren't so positive, but maybe in a research situation as well. What about an fMRI? They're, they're hard. You've had both. Ah, hard times. They, I mean, they're so noisy to be in, aren't they? It's a, I put my hand up in a research project once to be in an fMRI, and I really, it was so loud, I couldn't really concentrate on what they were trying to get me to do anyway. Um, well, look, thank you for that, Phil. And um, I, let's, let's just come to Shane. And before we proceed, because on the screen over here, you'll see we've got Shane rigged up. Describe the device uh, that you're hooked up to and what it's telling us, so that then what you'll be able to do is track Shane's response as we proceed today. Go for it. Made by a company called Emotive, and what you'll see is there's there's about 16 different electrodes surrounding my head, and as Phil said, picking up EEG signals. Now the Emotive company has uh, developed a, a range of algorithms to to make sure that the EEG is being processed in a certain way, and they've come up. What we're showing here on the screen is, is supposedly three measures. The blue one is is supposed to be frustration. Um, <laughs> How's it looking? Oh, it's, it's peaking. At the top, so <laughs> I, I would suspect that cons I can report I'm not frustrated, but frustration is also, a, you know, related to heightened anxiety or excitement, other sorts of descriptions of, of that sort of emotional. The red one, which is not being picked up, because as I'm talking, um, Phil mentioned the EMG. So when I'm talking, the muscles in my mouth are moving they're causing a lot of noise in the EEG signal. So, it's so what's the red one meant to tell us? It's supposed to be engagement, so how engaged I am, and that's measuring a type of EEG called beta, um, which is in, uh, a type of L, uh, beta wave, uh, which we commonly measure. Um, the lower one is instantaneous excitement. Again, it looks, <laughs> look, looks like I'm not a very exciting speaker to myself. No. So. so at the moment, Shane, you're very anxious, possibly very anxious fearful, and not very, bored, uh, to death, bored to death, and um, very disengaged. That's right. Well, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> That's your job, folks. That's right. <laughs> but, but tell us your story, because... You run this company, Inner Truth, yes. which is a seductive title. Is that what you're getting at, in a, the Inner Truth? Look, I, I, I like the name and, and came up with the name, uh, along with my business partner as well, mainly probably coming from my forensic background and working with the sort of pathological side of, of the human behaviour and, and, again, using... Uh, micro expression analysis if everyone sees the show lie to me uh, I did that sort of training uh, and use that in in the forensic system so that's I, watching the very minute yes, details in absolutely. a face to see whether someone well, might be the lying face as well as the body language so often people if they're frustrated or angry they'll do interesting things like squeeze their hand or tap their foot or they'll lean a certain way those sorts of things so when I got into market research I started to use a lot of that previous forensic work to actually, um, when I was facilitating focus groups, figure out if people were actually comfortable with their responses to what they were saying in response to an ad or a product or, or uh, a print or a brand or whatever it was we were testing. So from there, my undergraduate degree in neuroscience um, led me to, to look at the opportunity of using psychophysiological measures such as EEG to help us better understand uh, consumer responses, um, both in, in the, the space where uh, often people can't articulate why they like something um, versus uh, when they can easily identify what they like. Uh, often when it comes to advertising or pack design, we ask somebody, how much do you like like that? And in a focus group to say, oh, I don't like the color red or I don't like the print that doesn't necessarily help an advertising agency per se. They're looking for an emotional response um, to get at that sort of understanding. So that's how it came to be that inner truth is about using both <laughs> what people say they like, but also using the physiological measures to, to actually make sure that they're actually coming together to make sure that the companies I work with are actually creating 
um, value for, for customers as well as the company themselves and, and getting that sort of relationship established. So when, when I first met you, I, I actually was surprised to find that there was a neuromarketing company in Australia mm. because it is such a fledgling field, isn't it? So let, give us a sense of who your clients are, the sorts of questions that they want answered. Yes. Uh, well, for example, a recent study I just did is for a, a global advertising agency. And what they're trying to understand is the different types of advertising and, and how engaging that is. So, for example, we all see at the moment on television the, the uh, well, I say they're annoying brand power ads where you get, it's like an infomercial basically, where someone's on the screen. Uh, the Martin Grellis, the BAM ones are the most annoying. He's yelling at you and he's in your face versus something like um, the uh, Bogues draft ads where they tell a story and they engage you and they take you on a bit of a journey about what the, the, the brand is trying to deliver to its customer. So they're trying to understand, well, what actually ads are most engaging to consumers based on, on that style of advertising? Because as an advertising agency, they're about trying to create um, content that consumers want to see. Uh, want to engage with, which will then help when they're at that supermarket shelf, say, okay, I've got an option of five. Well, I really like that ad, so I might consider the, this I mean, you product. really want to make people feel good, ultimately. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can engage them, but whether or not that translates to actually someone picking the product off the shelf and buying it, it's a whole other question, isn't That's it? That's exactly right, because you can imagine even the experiments that we do are in a very controlled laboratory environment, I'm a father of three kids. When I'm at the shops, I got seven-year-old twins pulling me each direction. A three and a half year seven-year-old twins. Yes, yeah, so mm. three and a half year old pulling me in another oh direction. Gosh, Sometimes yeah. it's just, oh, I don't even know. I'll just grab that and, and move on just to, to get out of the mm. aisle or, or, or down. So even though we're trying to at, at best predict what's going to be most engaging and, and get that purchasing decision, that product on that higher level of, of a consideration set. Um, it's still, it's a laboratory versus real world. Mm. Let's just get a, a quick mm. intro to the science that you're exploiting, so to speak. Yes. What instruments are you using uh, to help your clients? What we currently use is we use EEG, not this one. It's, uh, as you can see, it's not necessarily that reliable. Um, so you're now still anxious, yes, bored, still and... Yes, anxious, bored, In and fact, you look dead. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like a heart, <laughs> flat line on a heart rate, absolutely. Someone get up and tickle the man. <laughs> um, so we, we do use EEG, uh, a different type of recording. Uh, you would have seen some of the images on the net where it would look like an old-fashioned style swim cap. Uh, so we use that type of EEG and we use gel, uh, a type of conductive gel in each of the electrode spots. Uh, in order to ensure that we're actually capturing good EEG signals, as well as, and Phil showed eye tracking, we use eye tracking as well, so we can get a, a good measure of what people are actually looking at, as well as what the, the brain is actually responding to. We measure those two together to try to get an understanding of, of what part of that stimulus is actually um, correlated with, with that brain response. Are you confident in the science? I'm confident in the science that we use, um, because we use uh, EEG technology that uh, you would find in any hospital. Um, I can't speak for everyone out there, um, but the science we use definitely. Because we'll come to that, no yes. doubt, because there's an awful lot of neuro hype and some would say yes. neuro tosh out Absolutely. there. Um, before we come to Peter, and let's have Peter on the screen, shall we? Just because you're flatlining and yeah, I think I'm that's boring. Now, yeah. I think Peter will look much more interesting. Hello up there, Peter. Um, Phil, can I come to you first, though? I mean, Marketing uh, people, advertising agencies have reached out to technology for decades, in mm. fact. Mm. I mean, for 30 years yeah. they've been reaching out to try and find some new tools, sometimes gimmickry, yep. um, to do what they do. So just explain that trajectory a bit and how we're in a very, are we in a very different era now, do you think, with brain scan technologies and, and I guess higher resolution devices? Yeah, I think there's, <coughs> there's a number of factors that are, are playing into it because uh, the 1990s were the decade of the brain and I think there was a lot of media about brain that, that, that reached mainstream awareness um, and there's a number of factors that came together at about that point in time. One was that, in fact, that book that I mentioned, Antonio Damasio's book, Descartes' Era, uh, was a hugely read 
book and his message of that we can't ask people how they make decisions. We need to um, we need to connect with them in some other way to understand really what people are thinking. Now that message really spread through the marketing community. They took that message to heart. I guess another part of the um, the timeline that's that's relevant is that a lot of this technology um, is only now really becoming available to to. Um, organisations, marketing research organisations. So it's come out of the lab, out of the hospital, and it's becoming more widely used by uh, companies such as, as Shane's, where, whereas it wasn't previously. Um, Is there an element of, and forgive me, boys with their toys? Yeah, they're pro they're um, possibly it's easy be. to be kind of seduced by a new, yeah. a new toy. It, it is, um, and it's a great looking device that yes. Shane's got on his yeah. head. But um, yeah. is it is it really pr progressing? I mean, what 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 about the good old fashioned? ask someone, the, yeah. the focus group. A and that's that's the, the core of the problem, that there's this research from the lab showing us that when we do focus groups, look, there's a lot of very deep and relevant information that we can gain from focus groups. That there's other research from the neurosciences showing that if you ask someone a question about why they made a decision, they will give you an answer and they will do their very, very best to give you an honest answer. But very often it is just not true. And it appears that we have systems hardwired into us that fill in the gaps that when subconscious processing actually results in a certain kind of decision, we, we literally manufacture an explanation that makes sense to us about why we made the decisions we did. And so Michael uh, Gazaniga has what he calls the left brain interpreter, mm. which makes sense of the things we do after, after we've done them. And so that tends to <coughs> part that, that may come out in the focus group. So yeah. we're less in control of our thoughts than perhaps we think we are. There's, there's a lot bubbling away beneath the surface that we're not aware of, that's for sure. Well, let's come to our neuroscientist above our heads. Peter, hello. Can we hear you? No, we can't. I didn't think we could. Can we, can we hear you through the speakers? Hello. Uh, ah, there you are. Hello. I ah, beautiful. Good to okay. hear your voice. Can we hear you? Let's just say yeah. that. Okay, Peter, I've got a question for you. I mean, how, to what extent, um, what proportion of our cognition, our thinking is unconscious? Because this is extraordinary. If what Shane and Phil are saying is true, an awful lot is going on in the netherworld of the brain that we really don't know about or possibly have any control over. Well, I think that it's very hard to put a, a number on it, I, well, I could speculate about numbers, but there's no question that there's a significant amount of cognitive activity uh, that goes on in the brain to which we are uh, incapable of um, assessing, that, that all, all sorts of things happen um, without our conscious awareness of it. And if you think about it, it um, if you just walk down the street, there's a, a tremendous amount of computation that goes on just to organize your balance and your limbs moving appropriately. And you never think about those sorts of things. You can think consciously about it, but that's a, a tremendous amount of computational effort, um, which goes on. The term that we use is subconsciously. It's not completely clear what that means in neurological terms, but certainly there is a, a, a lot of um, activity that goes on in that realm. And the interesting issue with respect to the, the, the uh, kinds of things that we're discussing this evening, yes, it's evening there, um, is really how much those events affect our decisions. And this becomes really a, um, an important thing to think about. It's actually kind of a deep philosophical issue and, uh, and it's something that is, in fact, very important to each and every one of us, the degree to which um, we are making decisions that are ours, that are authenticated as ours, or we are making decisions that are affected by the world around us. And the truth of the matter is that every day we make decisions that are some mixture of those two. I would like to say that all of my decisions are entirely my own, but um, I, I'm quite aware that that would be uh, a falsehood. And 
Um, and now with deeper understanding of the underlying neuroscience, some inroads are being made into both understanding that underlying neural circuitry and ways of um, getting at it. And then we can talk about that as we go along. Well, Peter, you're interested in the philosophical questions raised um, by some of these questions, but you are particularly uh, concerned now with the ethical questions raised by the neurosciences and development in the neurosciences. So how, how do you come at this um, growth in neuromarketing as a neuroscientist and as an ethicist? Well, so I, I think that the, the issue that we grapple with, and I, uh, you know, within the field of neuroethics, we, we struggle with this issue as much as everybody else, is the degree to which neuromarketing, um, even if you put aside the hype, um, it, if it's carried to its logical conclusion, the extent to which it threatens a concept that pretty much everybody understands, but the philosophers have spent a long time thinking about called autonomy. And autonomy is literally self-rule. So that's that ability for uh, an individual to make a decision themselves. And there's uh, traditionally sort of, there are many models, but the standard model of autonomy would run something like this, that um, we have both um, higher order beliefs and desires and lower order desires. And some of those lower order desires, oh, might be, well, I'm sitting here talking to this audience. I want to um, appear intelligent. That would be my higher order desire. But in the meantime, I might, I've been having a couple of cups of tea to keep me up. And so I might actually have to go to the bathroom pretty soon. And that would be a <laughs> lower order desire. And there's a conflict there between my desire to remain in touch with my audience and um, my body's um, desire to uh, eliminate this some waste. We will permit you to have a toilet break if you're mm -hmm. desperate at any point. Oh, no, no. <laughs> at the moment, I'm not quite de desperate. But so what I decide to do, though, in the end, is um, thought to uh, um, require the frontal part of my brain, my prefrontal cortex in particular, to make the decision of what I'm going to do. So. In this particular case, I'm a relatively rational, intact uh, adult with what's called cognitive control. And so I'm going to sit here and kind of tough it out and talk to you uh, for the next hour. But um, it would be possible to tap into those lower order desires, which are, they're called first order desires, and then the higher order desires are called second order desires and uh, make them more urgent. Of course, they become more urgent as time goes on. I think the example is, is everybody has had that experience. But the autonomous decision, the really important part of this is that for a decision to be autonomous, it really needs to be one that um, my frontal cortex ultimately decides and not some lower level unconscious desire um, feeding into the decision to uh, such a degree that I lose control and somebody else gains control. And that is a real threat to autonomy. So you see a future uh, where neuromarketing might target our unconscious desires uh, in ways that we might not be aware of um, or realise or want. But hasn't the, isn't that what marketing people have always been doing? So there's no question that's what marketing, that, that, that's the whole point of marketing. And that's why there's some tension here in terms of um, thinking about this. It, it's perfectly reasonable for the market, for business, to do whatever they can to sell their products. Where this becomes a problem, though, and, and it was... Um, kind of interesting in Phil's presentation um, is when uh, it moves over into something that we've termed stealth neuromarketing. And so stealth neuromarketing would be where a, a product is imbued with certain characteristics that um, I, it's hard to, to imagine forcing you, but that make the statistical likelihood of, of your decision being to buy that product so high that you're likely to buy it, 
and yet you're completely unable to ever know that that, ha uh, that, that influence has ever been there. Because it's one thing to make a decision when presented with a range of information, and even if you're influenced in some way. But if you're not able to know it all, then you really lose control over the game. And it is a game of sorts. And we think that that's really where things become, kind of move into um, sort of this uncanny valley of being creepy, where, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really want somebody else to decide which kind of tomato soup I'm going to buy, or if I'm going to buy tomato soup at all. I actually would like that decision to be mine, and I would like everybody to be able to make the decision for themselves with all of the appropriate um, uh, constraints on, on, you know, that business is allowed to do what, what they're allowed to do. But this gets into kind of um, uh, funny territory. It's woolly territory, isn't it? Because to what extent do we... Uh, so many influences. There are so many influences on why we buy, what we do, what we choose to do every day. Phil, I think you've got a response. I mean, what, what do you, and, and Shane too, what do you think of those concerns that Peter has and his colleagues in the sort of neuroethics community that maybe there's a future where we'll overstep the line and compromise people's autonomy? Mm. Well, I guess my initial response is um, I don't think the goal of neuromarketing or the goal of marketing at all is, is about manipulation, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and the reason for that is, I think, um, up until about 1950s, perhaps, organisations focused on efficient production and sales techniques to, to generate profit. But after the 50s, there's been a shift in what marketing is all about. And the, the, the idea of the marketing orientation or an organisation that has a marketing orientation is one that is focused on bringing the, the effort of the whole organisation together to meet the needs of customers. Because in the end, that, that is what drives the long-term relationship with a customer. If I manipulate a customer, I may have some short-term benefit if I can do that. And I think that's questionable about whether I can do that. But if I manipulate, I get one sale. But what happens after that is the customer, there's a huge amount of decision-making that occurs after the purchase is made. And that's all about my satisfaction. Have I gained the benefits that I sought to achieve? Was my need met? And all these things go on after the fact. And if those needs are not met, well, I won't go back. And I will go either to a competitor or some other kind of product. And so the idea of manipulation... The question is, though, obviously, sometimes marketing sells us products that we don't need yeah. or want until, we, until we're told that we want them. I think that's that's probably question, questionable is too. That my so that's up for take. grabs. <laughs> but I guess the other point that I want to make is I'm not clear about how how neuromarketing, specifically neuromarketing, instills uh, these manipulative features. Because I think the neuromarketing that we've talked about today is all about getting a read on people. It's not about putting something in. It's about actually understanding how people respond to something. Uh, so any any criticisms we could level that we've currently um, linking with neuromarketing, I think we're really just talking about potential criticisms of marketing as a whole. So it's interesting though, Shane and Phil, I mean you're getting a read on people, but in this case you're getting a read on people in a way that tells you something about them that they perhaps don't even know themselves. Mm. Shane, what do you, you think about that? Uh, I think Phil, Phil started to answer the, the marketing question. I think it, going back to um, the sort of autonomy. I look at it more from my old philosophy of the mind days uh, at uni is, you know, it's comparing free will versus determinism. So do we have free will in our decision making or is everything determined by external forces? Now my, my influence from, from moral philosophy is from Locke and Hume and, and their argument was, well, that's just, it's a verbal and semantic debate about free will versus determinism and it's more around understanding that as human beings, we have this frontal cortex that allows us to, at any point in time, stop and think about the decisions that we're making. Now, if we don't have that capability, then we're going to have a different discussion. Um, and from an uh, from a ethics standpoint, I think that is an important discussion to have because we know from neuroscience that not everybody has that capability, such as young children. My company would never do research 
on young children. Some would though, wouldn't they? I would suspect that some some potentially So would. you pop the kids in a scanner and see what, what they respond to. That's right, and, and, I, and I suppose then we start to, to touch across the, the often debate, well, it's that state versus personal freedom to make our own decisions and how much parental control, how much parental responsibility is it over the children to to help them learn to make the right decisions. As a psychologist, that's what I spend half my clinical practice on is teaching people on how to make the right decisions when they weren't making the, the right decisions based on an in inability to understand their own emotional states. So, but from a neuromarketing standpoint, it's I look at it as, as Phil said, you know, I could, could ask if this was a quasi-focus group, I could say, ask everyone, wh how do you, what do you feel the temperature of the room is? And I'd probably get a hundred different answers. Mm. Whereas it'd be just easier for me to use the, a thermometer to get mm. a, a more of an accurate measure. Mm. So I, I'm sort of saying, well, from an EEG perspective, and, and there are lots of limitations to what we can actually do with the EEG, uh, some of which feel touched upon, and the differences between MRI and EEG. You know, we're, we're actually measuring at various parts of the brain, and we can only hypothesize based on the neuroscience theory that this is what's likely happened. I would never do a neuromarketing study, and I, I counsel my, my clients on this, on understanding how people use products. Why would I want to get somebody's brain response on, on how to use products? I'd just ask them. You know, if I want to know how they're using a vacuum, I'll just ask them, mm. you know, or how often. So there are certain areas which it's just highly impractical. What you know, are you actually measuring? I mean, what what... What what do you, wh what, what's the connection that you're making between what you measure in the EEG and what you then tell your clients about whether a product's working or not, or whether an ad is working if you're tracking it in time? So, what sorts of brain waves are you picking up on, and what does that tell you? And 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 that always comes back to the objectives of what the study is. So, for example, from from an advertising study, it might be um, if it's a 15 second ad, 30 second ad, or or a minute long ad. Um, you have to recognise that to run a 60 minute ad on television is, is exceptionally expensive. A 60 minute 60 ad? Seconds, sorry, 60 say, seconds, sorry, 60 second ad. <laughs> now that and, would be um, tedious. <laughs> is very expensive, 60 minute, yeah, that would yeah. be unbelievable. But 60 second ad is very expensive. So if I can tell them, look, cut 30 seconds out, you're not gonna lose your audience, um, then that's an important uh, savings for them, but it's also a saving for a consumer. So, as well. what would you be tracking with your so EEG and your eye we, tracker? We measure rest? two simple measures: just a, a measure of engagement um, based on on EEG activity, and that's looking at um, uh, the whole power spectrum of EEG, different uh, waves, as well as a positive and negative um, sort of response, and that's from the uh, uh, an approach sort of withdrawal. Uh, response we're looking at. So are we more likely to an approach a stimulus or are we more likely to withdraw from that stimulus? And in fact that's, that is, uh, sits in the brain in two, hemis two different hemispheres quite differently, doesn't it? So that's correct. It's kind of a yes. positive association with the, the left prefrontal that's cortex, right. isn't there, and a sort that's of right. negative or withdrawing effect on the, the right side. That's correct, yes. So, and that tells you, you, that tells you what you think they need to hear? Yeah, absolutely, and because often if uh, what we're finding in our study, say for example, if we're uh, a company hired us to do a logo design and 12 different concepts, you run them through focus groups as you do, by the 12th logo, and I showed this in, in Phil's lecture last year, by the 12th logo people are bloody exhausted after looking <laughs> at 12 logos trying to pick what they like, this line, yeah. um, versus um, when we actually look at the EEG as well. When you combine those two things together, what people say they like, as well as measuring the, the brain activity, you can get absolute clarity about which logo I is likely to be um, the best one to go with and, and stop wasting thousands and thousands of dollars. If everyone remembers the, and I love using this one with my clients, the Vegemite um, 2.0 snack, oh. eye snack 2.0. Um, everyone sort of in the public eye thinks that that was a probably a very large PR stunt by Kraft, but I can guarantee the, the costs involved in something like that. 
epic. Are just mm. epic, and, and mm. the sales of Vegemite would never have covered that. So absolutely. cut straight to the chase by cutting to the brain is your yeah, idea. Yeah, absolutely. P- Peter Reiner, can we come to you? What's your take on sure. the science that's being used um, by neuromarketing at this point in time? Is it ripe enough? Is it ready enough for this sort of exploitation in the market? Um, well, actually, to be perfectly honest, from the wearing my neuroethicist hat, I'm actually quite pleased with how um, to some degree, unripe the science is. So uh, one thing that I like to tell people is that there's really the kinds of concerns that we have about real stealth neuromarketing, that somebody can get in there and control your so um, precisely. It, the science is nowhere near um, that well developed. I, I think that the insights that come from EEG, which of course is a technology that's been around for many years, but is enhanced considerably with um, modern computer analysis that can be applied to these waveforms, and from um, fMRI to some lim- some limited degree, uh, are, are very, very intriguing, but um, really we're not quite at the fine grain nuance level that we might want to get to in order to get the deeper insights that we really want. But, you know, the reality is that... Oh, have we lost you? People are in the neuromarketing field have been refining. And there's this thing that, and it always surprises me that the neuromarketing um, field doesn't discuss this notion of theory of mind much more. Because when we look at other people, we, we infer many, many things about their state of mind. Are they lying? Are they telling the truth? Are they uh, angry? Are they sad? Uh, did they intend to do this or did they not intend to, to do this? And so our brains are very naturally attuned to understand human brains quite well. Uh, and the, what the neuromarketing is trying to do is to get at uh, nuance of that, and I think that it's a, a, a valiant effort. Um, I think that they're going to make a lot of progress. They're not quite where um, where they may want to be yet, but I, I have um, no doubt they'll get there. Peter, you and your colleagues have um, written quite extensively calling for a code of ethics for the neuromarketing, emerging neuromarketing industry. So what would be some of the items in that code of ethics? What would it look like? And what's the impetus? Well, so the impetus uh, of having a, a, a code of ethics is really the, the, the challenge here is um, one where all of this activity goes on outside of any regulatory framework. And if one has concerns about any of these issues, you, you really would like to see actually the industry itself self-regulate or begin to sign on to a code of ethics. And um, among the things that are um, sort of trivial, it, it seems, but perhaps not um, entirely so, um, it, private companies, when they uh, go through the kinds of testing that they go through, they're outside of the umbrella of informed consent. And so the, su- the research subjects that they include in their experiments, at least in North America, I don't know exactly how it works in Australia, but I'm assuming it's the same sort of thing, um, that the research subjects aren't, aren't required to provide informed consent. And that has been the standard in human experimental research. And we think that that's actually a, a, a simple and, and useful thing for companies to, to do on a routine basis, to protect their research subjects um, as we would protect them in any uh, sort of research ex- uh, experiment. And that's interesting, um, isn't it? Because it's certainly in research in universities, that's covering things like, well, what happens if you have an fMRI or an EEG and something untoward is discovered? And there's a whole sort of set of protocols around how you would manage that. Do you tell the person that they've got a brain tumour when all they've come in is to do a, a, a fun study? For example. Uh, that, that's that's exactly right, and and as you know, my colleague uh, Judy Ellis has done a lot of work on 
um, developing those protocols for how people in um, in the experimental situation deal with those kinds of incidental findings. It's not at all clear what would happen if similar discoveries were made in a private company, or what, or really, to be perfectly honest, what their responsibility is, um, given that they are operating outside of the legal strictures of, of informed consent. That way. Um, so. I'm interested in I'd like to your response. So, Shane, yeah, how do you feel about um, a code of ethics being developed? I know there's been a bit of a push in the US to try this for, for your industry. Well, look, in Australia, we've got the Australian Market and Social Research Society, which has a, a strong code of ethics, um, both covering um, informed consent. Any study that, that my company does, there's two levels of informed consent. The first stage is at the recruitment phase. So when the recruitment company calls somebody to participate, they're explained everything that's going to happen should they wish to, to participate. And then they, when they actually come to the study themselves, they have an information sheet which they are, for, they are forced to actually sit down and read it, um, as well as sign it that they actually completely understand what the actual study is about and what's actually going to happen to them. Um, probably over the top, and maybe that's my psychologist ethics and, and principles coming to work, but our company has those two levels of informed consent, so that's, that's clearly um, the case. So I can't, again, I, and you don't have to be a member of the Australian Market Social Research Society to be a practicing mm. market research company, so that's an issue in itself. And, and is and the society keeping up with the neuroscience? I know certainly the legal profession, mm. for example, is facing some of the same challenges. You know, all of a sudden brain scan evidence is making its way into the courts and yes, people are going, right. oh my God, what does it mean? You know? That's, that's right. I, I, I don't necessarily think they are. I think the I'm trying to petition the, the society to, to start to look into it a, a bit more to see if there is something that we need to add to the code of, of ethics and, and guidelines and practice uh, for neural market research. Um, so we, w we will be, be looking at that uh, into the future, absolutely. Phil, what, what's your take on a code of ethics? And, mm. and we want you to get your questions and comments um, ready and raring to go. We're going to get a mic roving around in a tick. Yeah, I think it's absolutely critical. I think it, it must be done. Um, as an academic, um, as, as you'd be aware, there are very, uh, very rigorous ethical protocols surrounding the research that we do, whether it's neuroimaging research or, or purely sitting someone down in, in front of a computer mm. uh, to do some kind of task. Um, and I think the, some of the issues um, that, that Peter has raised are, are critical. Protecting human, human subjects, for example, is, is a critical issue. I think another one is the fact that people are revealing their, almost their core being when, when they're having an MRI or an, an EEG uh, reading taken. It's their um, private self. It, it is their the private self. The inner sanctum. And mm. there is a question about well, what is done with that data. Is mm. that data uh, protected? Uh, and is that data used for any other purposes after the fact? And, and I know that one of, the interest, uh, one of the interests of large neuromarketing companies is to build up some kind of database of scans that they've collected that they can use post hoc to achieve some other goal. So I think we really need to look closely at those kinds of issues. What about neurohype? Because, uh, I mean, Peter, neurohype can do both the neurosciences damage, can't it, but also the marketing sector damage mm. as well. So I'll get your comments on that. But Peter, what's your take on, on some of the hype around the neurosciences in different fields? So um, this, is, uh, this is hopefully becoming a bit of a self-correcting problem, but there has been a, a great deal of hype that has particularly accrued to um, the lovely um, color pictures that come out of fMRIs. And I, I always like to call them pseudo color pictures because those colors are actually painted on after the fact. Those aren't really colors inside your brain uh, <laughs> that are, I mean, our brains don't come as There's paint by number objects. <laughs> it's very, very lovely. And it's very, very compelling to people. There have been quite a number of studies now where people have been asked um, whether they found a particular result in the neurosciences plausible with or without those images. And the, the plausibility factor goes up many fold um, when the images are there. So the problem for the neurosciences is, is really one of developing a bad name for 
um, presenting data in the uh, popular press that is probably not quite ready for prime time. And that would be my, um, my very polite way of describing it. Um, and so within the neurosciences, people are, are really gravely concerned because scientists view themselves as ultimate arbiters of honesty. And if this hype goes out there, then the overall reputation of scientists go, uh, diminishes. And, and I think there are even some polls that have shown that in the last few years that has happened, not specifically neuroscientists. And I don't know how much the neuro hype has contributed to that, but it is mm. a, a real issue. Mm. The other side, of course, is whether the neuro hype is being sold to, um, to businesses uh, from the marketing companies. And I think that there, uh, there's less concern. I think there is a buyer beware issue and that the businesses should be sophisticated consumers of whatever information they buy. Um, they might fall into the same sort of traps, but it's less of a concern, uh, certainly uh, uh, at large. Mm. Um, neuro hype stands to damage your industry too, doesn't it? So you've got to tread very carefully, I imagine, about what you take from the neurosciences at what point in time. Uh, absolutely, and, and I think from my perspective as, as, a, as an owner of a, of a company that does neuromarket research, it's... I, s I read so much in the press and, and um, what the, the media reports. You know, there's always papers coming out of the U.S. of uh, some company purporting some outrageous sort of finding. It's the buying spot. Yeah, well, ab yeah. absolutely. You know, the, the, the buy button is the, is the, the buy biggest button. thing. Yeah, that's, that's, right. that's right. And, you know, and, and constantly my clients are, are asking me, well, ca can we find X out? Can we find Y out? And I say, no, I basically have to say, well, no, you, you can't. This is what you can do, and this is what you cannot do um, with neuromarket research. Um, they, it, and it's an education process, and it comes back to the responsibility of the neuromarket research companies um, to educate their, their customers on what they're actually buying. You know, and, and, I, and I can't mm. speak for every company out there that they're going to do that ethically and, and tr transparent with transparency as well. Having been a forensic psychologist, I guarantee you that they're not. There are fibbers out there. They are. <laughs> That's right. There are fibbers out there, but not in here, not tonight.